events. And I, I want to start saying that actually this is the result of the work of a lot of people. So some of the original ideas and, and of the implementations comes from Herbert Sauer Lab, University of Washington, in particular from Deepak Chandran and Q. Hyun Kim. And uh, the analysis and curation was done by Pablo Mayer, who will speak after me, together with Toma at TBI and, and, and Gustavo. So why, why did we do this challenge? So those of you who have been following DREAM will know that uh, for many years there were a lot of challenges about network inference. And in fact, the word DREAM stands for Dialogues in Reverse Engineering Assessments of Methods. So we have studied a lot how to get the topology from the data, and there's been a series of challenges by Daniel Marbach and many others where we have learned a lot. So we thought that for this challenge we could try to go one step further and try to answer the question that if we know the topology reasonably well, can we take from this topology a mechanistic model and then try to characterize the kinetics of these models? That means to identify the parameters that underlie the model. And also, given that even though we may have a good topology, it's unrealistically to expect that we will be able to know it perfectly well, we would like to also address the question of how can we refine a given topology uh, that is to find perhaps some missing links or, or to rewire it slightly. And, and the other um, twist we wanted to give to the challenge is to bring uh, a practical aspect which most of us face, which is the fact that the budget is limited. And therefore, we need to think very carefully which experiments we do. So the, the question we wanted also to address in this challenge is how, how can we choose the most informative experiments in particular, to answer the questions below. That is, how to define the parameters or how to refine a given topology. So to address these questions, then we set up a challenge uh, which is based on building a gene regulatory network built with mechanistic detail. And I will explain quite some time telling you how that was done. Then establishing uh, in silico, so not based on real data, a system to, to, to do experiments and then for the participants to buy the experiments. And then, based on this system, we gave people a model. We gave some starting data to start playing with, as well as credits to buy new experiments. And then we asked them in the first challenge to find the parameters, and in the second, as you will see, to refine a given topology. So how was the model built? So we tried to incorporate quite some uh, molecular details so that for each gene, we will have protein coding region, the ribosomal binding site, as well as activatory and repressor binding sites. And then we model explicitly translation and transcription in a simple manner. So translation is just a linear equation, like for example for this gene here, gene 4, it will be a function of, um, of, of the strength of the binding to the RB site, as well as to the transcription. And transcription itself will be a linear function of the effect of all the activators and all the repressors. So again, for model uh, gene 4, uh, it will be uh, the product of the effect of um, the AS4, which is the, the activatory side, and RS2, which is the inhibitory side, multiplied by a, a, a constant. And then, in turn, these two terms are modeled with uh, nonlinear Hill equations that contain the parameters that you have to, to, to estimate, namely the binding constant and the Hill coefficient, which determines how sigmoid is the effect. So this is how each of these genes was modeled. But then the question, of course, is how we build a gene regulatory network with a set of genes that is uh, interesting. And I think we had a wonderful talk this morning at the mic, where we could see how this actually can be done in, in, in real biology. So in this case, we try to approximate this uh, in silico. And the basic idea was to find network motifs for which we can expect interesting behavior, connect them, and build simulations, and play and tune the parameters so that we have a network with interesting behavior. And this was done by Deepak Chandran. So without going into much detail, we tried to incorporate different type of motifs, for example, negative feedback. So we had gene 1, which will activate gene 2. And then gene 2, in turn, will negatively regulate the first gene and this can lead to oscillations or other properties. We have also regulatory cascades, so one gene activating another one, and this another one. So these feed-forward cascades uh, can make, for example, very steep input-output relationships. We also have 
in the network uh, incoherent feed forward loop. That is protein 6 would positively activate protein 7, but at the same time it would positively influence, sorry, protein 8, and at the same time protein 7, which in turn will negatively activate protein 8. And we also had a positive feedback in, into the model. So then combining these different elements and finding suitable parameters, we came up with the network which is shown here, which is the network we use for sub-challenge one, which has nine different genes. And because we have both the expression and the protein, we have 18 variables in the model. So this is a dynamic model built with differential equations. Each of these different genes are modeled following the, the case I saw you at the beginning, so with transcription, translation, and so forth, and they have associated the number of parameters. And then what we gave to people is um, this model in a number of formalisms, the systems biology markup language, which can be read by many tools, as well as specific formats for three tools, MATLAB, COPASI, and JARNAC. And it had the inclusion of the red laws in an explicit manner, and then the question was to find the parameters. So now let me tell you a bit about how we build the system to, to, to buy experiments, to mimic um, the situation in a real lab. So we had this grant where you have 10,000 credits, and with this money you could buy a number of experiments. The experiments uh, could have different quality and accordingly different cost, and we tried to approximate what could be real differences of cost and, and quality in, in, in real biology. So you could perturb your network in a number of ways. You could do, for example, a gene knockout and eliminate all the transcripts and the proteins. This will cost you 800 credits. You could do an RNA, and this will increase tenfold the degradation of mRNA. This was much cheaper. Or decrease the RBS activity, which is a similar price than the RNA screening. And then you could ask for different readouts, which again have different qualities and different prices. You could ask for microarrays, time series of microarrays, and this could be at low or high resolution, so a different amount of, of measurements at the price of 5 or 1,000. You could ask for the proteins, which we do with mass spec. Or you could specifically try to follow at high resolution uh, to, to proteins uh, using fluorescence protein fusion. And there was also the option to buy directly the, the parameters. Of course, you couldn't buy all of them, but if you wanted, you could spend most of your budget just to go in for a specific kinase, uh, sorry, a binding constant or heal coefficient. So this was how people could uh, participate. And then, um, as Gustavo said, in fact, this is a bit of a remake of a challenge from last year. And, and, and the reason that we had to do this is because last year we ran very much the same challenge, uh, but we found out through the process that there was um, problems with the integrators in different platforms and different tools. And without going into details which tools work better than others, what we decided this year is to be much more thorough in how we provide people the models and, and, and the data in a way that it can run. So we built our models with Tinkercell, a tool developed at Herbert Sauro, from which all the screenshots come. And then we try to be quite thorough in testing the models, the SVML models in a list of platforms shown here, with the hope that this year these integration models will not come again. Even though actually it has to be said that it was quite a good um, information for the community working on modeling these differences in, in the integrators, but that's perhaps out of the scope of uh, this discussion now. But anyway, because we had done the challenge last year, uh, but we wanted to do it again, but at the same time, we wanted to give something new that, you know, if, if you had played last year, you will have uh, something else to think about. We made a second challenge, which is sub-challenge two. And that's where we try to address this other question, which is, well, in truth, you will not have a perfect topology. So we're going to give you a good topology, but slightly imperfect. And we're going to ask you to, to tell us what is wrong in this topology. And in particular, there were three missing links in this network that you try to, to find. And because we thought this would be a bit of a harder problem, we simplify a bit the, the model description. In particular, the description is, is neglected. And we had a number of, of assumptions and, and explanations about the, the topology. Uh, 
So this was the, the network for subchallenge 2. It has 11 genes, but only 11 variables because we don't have a expression explicitly modeled. And so just to give you a sense of, of what the data looks like, this is the, the, the wild data, so the starting data that people got for subchallenge 2. So for the 11 different proteins, so over time you can see how well, there was quite an interesting dynamic. Many things will oscillate, thumb oscillations, and so forth. And then this is what we gave people with the topology and the money to buy new experiments. And I think at this point, uh, I'm going to pass to Pablo. And I think it's um, uh, just, well, thank again the, the people that I said before Pablo, Gustavo, and the people in Herbert's our team. And of course, all, all the participants, not just of this year, but also of, of last year, from which we, we learned a lot. So, and I think then I'll let Pablo to explain a bit more about how we did the scoring. And maybe it's better that then we, we go through the questions all together at the end, because the two talks are, are very linked, and maybe some things you will ask will be answered in the, in the next talk. I'm going to only answer one question, which probably nobody will ask, but many of you are wondering, which is, why I'm wearing this ridiculous mustache, or why Michael in, in my group this morning was also wearing a very, having a very ridiculous mustache, and this is because we are taking part in Movember, which is uh, an action to, to raise awareness for male cancer, testicular and prostate cancer, as well as, as funding, and so what we do is through this mo month we try to grow a uh, mustache for funny, but also a, a good reason. So I'll just let Pablo go on from here. <laughs> 